This is a story about the mysticism of the animal kingdom and its interaction with each other, about the intelligence and bravery of cats, and also about the importance of choosing a partner who has a thinking pattern that you understand, that you respect, and someone who respects your opinion. So in this story, I was living on a farm with my husband at the time. We are now divorced. And there was a little barn down the way from the house. And in this barn, um, we had there were chickens and the cats would sleep here. Would, would, it was kind of like the cat's home base. So I would go down there and feed the cats, feed the chickens. And yeah, the chickens were on one side, the cats were on the other. Like every day, it's kind of a ritual. And you know, this barn, it wasn't in the best repair. It had a side window that had been broken out. And there was a pitchfork, a big pitchfork that was always propped up against that window. And I had seen it there before. Um, I remember looking at it and thinking in my mind, hmm, I wonder why that's there. I wonder what that's for. So in my mind, I start coming up with ideas, you know, reasons. It's the creative way my mind works. And because of that, I had looked at it and saw that, oh, it actually looks like it's covering the window like, like a jail cell. So it's probably to keep something in or to keep something out. And I'm like, yeah, it looks like it makes sense. So until we can repair the window, let's just leave it. Well, every day when I go down to feed the cats, there would be a huge attack at the door, right? They would hear me jiggling open the little latch outside the gate and it was meow, 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 and they come attacking out of nowhere, right? And one wants to get the first crack at the food. But there was one day when I came down there, I jiggled the gate, there was no sound. I creaked the, great, the gate open, there was no sound. I called out to the 10 cats that lived there and it was dead silent. Now it wasn't just quiet, it was dead silent, which is not a very common thing for a farm with animals. And being someone who grew up on farms and who grew up in the woods, and who worked in forestry and who lived in a cabin in the mountains by myself for you know years cumulatively in my life i know that silence it's an unnatural silence and so the hairs on the back of my neck kind of stood up for a sec and then at that point i looked up and it's interesting because i feel like you can sometimes feel and I've mentioned this before in my previous telepathy video, you can feel when the police are looking at you, you can feel when a predator or a weird person or an intense person is looking at you. And when I looked up, I saw this, these two big yellow eyes looking at me from the dark. And then I saw this wonderful, huge white owl looking directly at me intensely. And at that moment, I stepped out of the barn. I swept my arm back to open the door as wide as it would go. And this beautiful white owl came down out of the barn and flew out the open window and into the field. At that moment, I ran back inside. I was looking around, I was like, did he kill my kittens? Like, is, what happened? And I started calling out to them. And then the most mystical thing happened. They started coming out of hiding. 
they knew that before when I called to them and I walked in that I didn't know about the owl. They knew not to come out. They knew to stay hidden, right? Maybe that owl had come in, they knew about it, and they went and hid, right? Cats, they are amazing master predators. Like, I have just seen some of the most amazing, you know, predatory moves by these cats. But they know their place, and they're not going to mess with this owl, even though it's only essentially a big bird, right? <laughs> they can see those huge eyes, and they know, right? And even as cats, maybe they even uh, psychically can sense the intentions of something without even seeing it. So they knew that when I came in, it wasn't, oh, yay, it's safe, now it's come out. No, no, they knew, right? And then after the owl was gone, and I and I called out to them, they knew it was safe to come out. Can you imagine? So they finally came out and they're all kind of shaken up and they, <laughs> they looked around and they were looking kind of like, oh, you know, like what happened? It was like really cute. And I was so grateful they were all there. Nobody was harmed, nobody was injured. And at that point, I'm thinking, how did that owl get in here? because the pitchfork is always on the window. So I look, and the pitchfork is gone. And I went, oh, okay, maybe it fell over, maybe the owl knocked it over, no, it was completely gone. So when I went up back to the house and I relayed this story to the person I had chosen to tie my life to and go live in the middle of nowhere with, uh, he told me that, oh yeah, I saw it there and I moved it. And I said, well, did you, like, you know, like, didn't you notice that the window was broke? Oh, yeah, I'll fix it another time. And I said, well, you know the cats are sleeping in there, and there's coyotes, and there's owls. Did you? No, I, so what, for him, he just saw something that didn't belong and said, oh, that doesn't go there, and moved it, right? It was like the lack of curiosity, the lack of open-minded thinking, the lack of thinking about how to protect something precious, how to care for and be concerned about the safety of something precious, right? It just didn't cross his mind. And um, yeah, we would get into other arguments. I remember saying, they're like, yeah, there's a, a meth lab down the road from here, probably. Like they got in trouble with the police and everything else. And I'm like, well, we're out here in the middle of the night, you know, the middle of nowhere alone. You know, it's like, you know, a, a huge drive for the police if we ever bothered calling. You know, when you call 911, which I had to do because of my medical condition at one point, very unfortunately, I'm like, it takes them an hour. So why don't we make sure that we have a way to scare people off or defend ourselves in case some like weird druggy person comes to the wrong house in the middle of the night and starts acting up? And he was like getting all offended. He's like, we can ask my uncle to save us or something. And we can just call my uncle. I'm like, we're going to call your 70-year-old uncle who lives 20 minutes up the road? Like, really? Like, you can you can go buy a gun at a garage sale in, in Montana for $50. And you're going to argue with me about it, you know? Um, yeah, so this is just, you know, for me, I... As I mentioned, we had just gotten married because of the formalities, because we wanted to live together in the U.S. and be able to work and live together in the U.S. Really, that was why. But I think it meant more to me um, because, you know, I, and, and it also represented something I had really, really, really wanted my whole life. I'd, I always wanted, like, a, a partner, a husband, and I always wanted to be part of a family. You know, I was willing to do whatever it took, you know. Um, however, when that um, became um, having to put up with, you know, emotional abuse, um, being treated poorly, even just because people cannot manage their own behaviors, right, or because other people were suffering and taking it out, um, that's when I had to be like, you know, this is a dream I'm going to have to let go of um, in this particular situation. And uh, it really sucked. Um, yeah, 
And that was just one example. We had so many other examples. Another one was the cross outside the house. So we were staying in this house. This house did not belong to us. It was like an extra house on the land that his cousins usually lived in in the summer. So we were like staying there for like a year while he helped, well, well while we worked on the farm. And um, they had this big, like, like human-sized r- painted red cross that was like um, nailed to like this post at the front house, at uh, the front of the house, like on the deck. And um, for me, I really value the symbolism of the cross and what it represents, even though I'm not a religious person. Um, but it did look kind of ominous, like <laughs> the fact that it was like painted red and like everything else. Um, that being said, I mean, hey, you know, like it's it's not. I wouldn't choose to put that in my house, but it's a reminder of the blood of Jesus you know, which was an occult ritual that saved humanity from the hell realm that we live in. So it, it, it is a promise. It's not what people think, but yeah, it is a promise, you know. Um, I didn't really like looking at it, but like, you know, it's meaningful to somebody. Somebody painted it, somebody chose where to put it and hung it up there, you know, and um, I came one day and he was like taking it down. And this doesn't surprise me, you know, I I do believe that he had a demon problem because I saw his eyes turn black in front of my very face twice. And I'm going to talk about this in future videos because people have talked about this before. Um, it, it's, it's not, you know, it's when you see that in somebody, you need to get away from that person. That's a, a level of rage that can become very dangerous very quickly. Um, and so, yeah, I know that when I was having demon possession problems, yeah, if I saw images of the cross or people talked about religion, I would get irritated. And, um, so yeah, when I came and he was taking it down, okay, that's interesting. I'm like, did you, did you ask them about it? He's like, no, like we're living here now and I don't want a year or whatever. And I was like, oh, Okay. Like, to me, like, it's not such a big deal. Like, I, I don't like it, but I don't hate it, you know? And I'm like, well, why don't you ask them what they want, like, what they think? He's like, no, no, I'm just going to go put it on the barn. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, so he took the, the cross down from the house, went and put it up on the barn. Now, this is the logic, right? I don't want this here, so I'm going to put it there, right? There's no level of emotional, like EQ, right? What could this mean to somebody? What might this look like? To me, this is very disrespectful. Do you know what I mean? It, it, you know, symbolically, metaphorically, you don't go and take someone's religious object down from their house and go reassemble it where the animals go to the bathroom. To me, this almost looks like an F you, right? And maybe some people might not take it that way. Um, you know, maybe they are just totally chill. However, I really want, wouldn't want to risk that. You know what I mean? Like if I went to someone's house and they had like the Buddha on the front doorstep and I didn't like it, I wouldn't go and take it and put it in the barn and be like, yeah, I just decided to go put it near the animal crap instead because I didn't want to look at it. Like, that's just really weird, right? Um, so yeah, that was another thing we argued about. I felt so weird and embarrassed and the number of um, weird social moments I had with him where I had to constantly explain stuff like that and he would argue with me, um, you know, it was just unreal. Um, yeah, just unreal. So. It's really important to find somebody who has a level of <clears throat> emotional intelligence and social awareness that, um, and empathy, you know, social empathy, right? It's very easy to fake empathy. So when somebody is sad or upset about something, you can say, oh my gosh, what's wrong? I feel so sorry for you. Tell me more, right? Whatever. But in a social, in, in delicate social situation, that's where you really see 
whether a person actually has empathy to think about how another person might feel or not. And, um, yeah. So yeah, make sure you have a person that has the same level or a similar level or an aspirational level of emotional intelligence for you. You know, because that's an area that I really value. I've put a lot of effort, a lot of um, study time into. If I met someone who had better EQ than me, who I could learn from, I would love that. And I have met, you know, a number of people who have a higher emotional intelligence than me, than me. And I've noticed things about them, like I... I do this one therapist who, oh gosh, I could just go on and on. <laughs> so how would it be at now? Almost 16 minutes. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to make a separate video about people who I've met who had social skills that impressed me. I'm going to go for now. Thanks for listening.